You know, did you ever did you ever know Joe Petticino? You know, sadly, no. And, um, you know, that's one of the guests I always wanted for 605. And I debated getting in touch several times or getting in touch with Bonnie Blackstone several times. Uh, unfortunately, when I was finally ready to do something was I had heard a whisper that he had uh, had his stroke and it turned out that was true. But uh, I wish I had had a chance to talk with Joe, a fascinating guy, an interesting guy who had been involved in various aspects of the business and then kind of just left the business. Well, yeah, well, I think he, you know, after the the last stuff, I think he finally had enough because he had so much energy and passion for everything and he knew he was going to do something. And he ended up meeting a number of, you know, goofballs as you do when you try to do something in the wrestling business. But I, I actually started watching Joe before I met him because he had the Saturday night superstars of wrestling block, uh, on uh, the first station was WATL, right? Channel 36. Um, on Saturday nights he, from eight o'clock until two in the morning, he would show all the syndicated wrestling shows, uh, Memphis, mid South world-class, uh, U uh, UWF uh, power pro. I think they had both of them on at one period of time when they split into both shows, but uh, WWF superstars, he had everything besides uh, TBS wrestling uh, in pretty much in the country in that six hour block weekly. And he would do the wraparounds and that's how he met Bonnie. His wife was, she won the contest to be his co-host. And wouldn't you know who won the pony, but they were, they weren't actually together then they were later. Uh, and they were married together for what, what was that been 85, 30 fucking five years. That pretty good. Anyway, um, what I would do is when in the summer of 85, when we first moved from Dallas to Atlanta, when Crockett was running the split offices, Atlanta and Charlotte, they put us in Atlanta supposedly to keep us away from the rock and roll express. We were based out of Charlotte for six months. We turned into three months, but for three months we were in Georgia mostly doing the Georgia town short trip territory on most Saturday nights. I was back from Columbus or wherever the fuck it may have been by, you know, 1130 at 12 o'clock. And I would have rolled tape on everything. So I'd sit there, I'd, I'd have time to get the dominoes and a giant soft drink. And I would sit there all night and watch the superstars of wrestling shows. So I knew what was going on everywhere. And of course, as soon as we moved to Charlotte and started traveling like that, that went out the window. I still get the tapes, but I'd fast forward a lot. Uh, but anyway, Joe started helping out the local promotions. He had helped out uh, Sammy Kent with North Georgia wrestling. And I think, oh gosh, what was when Blackwell was running, what was the name of his company? Oh, I forget the name. Yeah, I'm well, oh, you forgot Deep something. South. I'm getting it confused with Deep South, but that was Jody Hamilton. Um, but anyway, nevertheless, he started helping some of the local promotions, but he was in more in television because he'd been in radio and television sales and that business primarily and was just a big wrestling fan. And he actually got that pro wrestling this week magazine style show with him and Gordon Soley syndicated. It was in a ton of markets there at the time, the mid to, to the later eighties. And anyway, he'd, he'd had a lot more television success, uh, but he didn't really, he was never promoted himself, but he, well, he promoted himself plenty on his TV, but he never himself was a wrestling promoter. And, and then I, I met him when he came to WCW because Heard wanted people with TV backgrounds, Joe fit that and broadcasting backgrounds. And Joe fit that, but he also, he, 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 he was a big wrestling fan. I think probably heard thought that he, his level was on the, you know, or his knowledge was on the level of Eddie Graham. I don't think, you know, Joe would say that to me. He may have told heard that, uh, but he was looking at guys heard was like Steve Beverly and Joe Petticino to know wrestling and be TV guys. And this is not knocking Joe because he, he knew a lot more wrestling than most TV people and a lot more TV than most wrestling people. But it still, it was, they were start. the office was starting to listen to people who had television backgrounds and a lot of knowledge of wrestling and looking at the business as they looked at it, instead of looking at the business as people who were actually in the wrestling business looked at it. And that's where the disconnect came and shit started going south. 
um, in, in a lot of cases. But anyway, they brought Joe in to do the fan segment as the fans man, Joe Petticino knows, which we all started <laughs> calling Joe Petticino's nose, <laughs> which I, I don't know if I started that, but I certainly helped it along its way. Um, but Joe was, he was fun to work with. And ever that little run, then I can't remember what happened with him in Atlanta, but I know what happened with me in Atlanta, but the, he's the one that called me when I left uh, WCW and said, Hey, you want to do color commentary with me on the LPWA, the ladies professional wrestling organization association. And they were doing the TV tapings and it wasn't like glow. They were actually, they were having matches and without too much preposterousness. Uh, but the, the way the deal got funded was that Tor Berg, who was a, a promoter out of Minneapolis and knew Wally Carbo was one of the, was like the commissioner at one time. And they were bringing Wally Carbo to the taping. So I could sit and talk to him about Vern Gagne stories and fucking shit like that. And Ray Stevens, they brought as an agent a couple times. That's when I got to drive Ray Stevens back from Atlanta to Charlotte, when our flight got diverted and had him in the car for four hours by myself. Uh, but a lot of the AWA talent or, or, you know, mainstays were being brought in through that connection. But the whole thing got set up because Magnificent Mimi had a rich boyfriend in Las Vegas that was financing the whole thing. And as long as she was fucking around with him, he was giving Tor Berg the money to run the Ladies Professional Wrestling Association so she could be the top star. But then somehow she got heat with him, and then that's when he, the guy cut the money off and right in the middle of a big fucking run. Anyway, <laughs> so Joe asked me to come out and do color, and it was great. He, they, they brought me out once a month. And, you know, Bonnie did the black, black, Bonnie Blackstone did the backstage interviews and me and Joe did the announcing and the girl, you know, Leilani kind, Judy Martin were there. Some of the old time girls, Mula's girls that I knew and another, you know, the new generation, but like Bambi and Peggy Lee, you know, so, the, and Chris Love, Burt Prentice was there as the manager, the queen, Christopher Love. Uh, so that way we did that for about a year until Mimi fell out with her, with the backer. Uh, but Joe would, he would take me to the, uh, me and my uh, wife at the time actually would take us to the steakhouse in whatever hotel we were staying in. There was a few different ones, but there'd always be a steakhouse and he would sit down to order and he would say to the waitress, can you look around and get me the largest and rarest piece of prime rib that you have back there available? <laughs> <laughs> Every single largest and rarest. Um, and then <laughs> I'm, it's a funny fucking story. I'm not making fun of Joe, but he got a, and uh, when he still was doing the local TV show in Atlanta, he got a deal with this weight loss program because Joe had to be north of 400 uh, in those days. And he, the round mound of sound is what we nicknamed him at, in, at WCW. But he got a, a sponsorship where every week he would, he's supposed to give updates on he's on this weight loss program. I can't remember what it was or whether it was a gym or a diet plan or whatever it was, but this program and he'd give these updates and he'd show how much weight he lost and blah, blah, blah. As it got several weeks down the road, he hadn't lost any weight. <laughs> and I think there was actually an issue with that where he might've had to give some money back because he'd never really, I think it just kind of discontinued itself on the air and they carried it out. Uh, you know, in private after that, but it's sort of like Vader going to the Duke university weight loss clinic and gaining weight. Uh, but anyway, but I, I was sad to hear about that because I hadn't seen or heard from Joe or heard of Joe. You know, he did leave wrestling for the most part. And I think he did do one fan fest appearance in Atlanta. Uh, when Greg Price was doing the fan fest and switched it from Charlotte to Atlanta. And that's the year that Sinclair had just bought ring of honor and I couldn't go anyway. So I never saw him. So I haven't seen him probably in over 20 years. Did you see him after but, Global? After the one um, thing you and oh, Stan went to? Well, no. He, oh, no, we went to a couple. I think we, well, but here's another thing. <clears throat> so I mentioned he had never been a promoter. So I left WCW and he called me to do the LPWA. And then in the latter stages of that, he said, I'm going to be starting a promotion. I said, what? the global wrestling federation. I said, w uh, explain how well, and we're going to, we're going to, I can't remember all the things that he said at first, but it basically, 
as it came out, he was going to have national TV. He was probably going to, uh, I, I don't remember whether Dallas was his original location. He was going to shoot or not. Uh, but I think ESPN was mentioned, but the story was that he was, he had found a Nigerian businessman named, I'm going to butcher this, but something to the effect of Olu Oliani, who was going to finance him to the tune of $30 million to start a wrestling promotion. And at one time he had taken, and I, he sent me the letter of credit from a bank, and I still have it somewhere here. If if that old fax paper, the print hadn't just completely disappeared, he faxed me a letter of credit from a bank to Olu Oliani for thirty up to $30 million line of credit. And I'd never seen a line of credit letter from a bank for $30 million before at that time, but it sure looked halfway good enough to me, right? But I'm, this can't be right, but boy, somebody's going to a lot of trouble here, right? And he, he, was, he was banking on it. He was planning the biggest thing you've ever heard of. And then he was going to buy the USWA, the Memphis Territory, from Jerry Jarrett because I guess it was probably in 91 I came home to Louisville. It may be early 92. I can't remember whether I was home because of the holidays and did it or whether they specifically asked me to come. <clears throat> but they had a big TV taping in the Louisville Gardens for – because Jarrett at the time still had a relationship with ESPN, right? Yeah, he was on ESPN. And, okay, so they were doing an ESPN TV taping in the Louisville Gardens, and um, I did color and appeared on it in some respects throughout the night, and they also introduced Joe. Joe was there backstage. They talked about Joe Petticino being the, either the future owner of the USWA or starting the Global Wrestling Federation or whatever. It went that far. Also in the back of the Louisville Gardens that night was the aforementioned Olu Oliani. And when I saw him, I said, oh, you got to be kidding me. He looked like a Nigerian Louis Armstrong. He had these giant cheeks, this fat face and these giant cheeks. And he was walking around in what you would expect a Nigerian businessman to dress like in casual dress, this print shirt and something that looked like it was an expensive pair of slacks and these shiny shoes. And he had met a girl wrestler at the time that either was in Memphis or he brought her. I think she was working there just uh, whatever the fuck briefly. It was a Miss Texas is her name was sweet Georgia Brown. And she was this, this young black girl that is because some people I think have said, oh, wasn't that Miss Texas? She may have used that name, but this was just some independent girl. And he was just showing a lot of attention to this young lady. And obviously, you know, Joe was probably going to sign her up to be a big star in his wrestling promotion. And I'm like, I just can't believe this is happening but there's Jerry Jarrett talking to Joe seriously about purchasing the, the Memphis territory and later, and then they get on television and they do tapings from the sportatorium and they booked me and Stan Lane to come down and the global dome, not the, the sportatorium. The, well, the, the global dome as they renamed it, but I didn't see the Nigerian businessman there when we got there. And and anyway, the, a lot of stars were there. A lot of names were there. But it was the same old ring in the sportatorium because Joe said, well, it's bolted down to the ground. There's actually, there's a door underneath the ring. It goes somewhere. We're not sure. I'm like, fucking hell. Um, but we, we worked at one taping, but I could sense also something was wrong. When he was paying us good money each and bought us each a plane ticket from Charlotte to Dallas and back, but uh, I asked about hotel. I said, can we stay at the La Quinta at the airport? Oh, we've got a, uh, we're putting all the talent at a hotel in between the airport and the building. Okay, we got to this fucking hotel. And first they had me and Stan down to a uh, uh, room with each other, which that didn't work for either one of us because of our differing lifestyles. So we know individual rooms and then we opened these rooms. 
there was two lights in my room with a combined wattage of 40 in both these <laughs> fucking light fixtures in this goddamn, it was like an old motor court that the rest of New Dallas had been built up around and it was spooky laid out and all the doors went straight out into the parking lot and fucking dark as a goddamn tomb. Smelled a little off kilter. I said, nah, we'll see you later. So we went back to La Quinta and checked in and went down to the sportatorium and presented the bill to Joe. Uh, it was like they were getting those rooms for like $29 a piece in Dallas at near the airport. Even in those days, that was pretty good. So I smelled something was wrong there. And then I shortly afterwards, it went from Olu Oliani. The Nigerian businessman didn't have $30 million, but Max Andrews was the, the backer, the syndicator in Dallas was the backer behind the thing at that point. Is that correct? I think so. I believe that's the way it happened. But anyway, but they did some good shows. Joe just, I don't know about the handsome stranger thing for Bagwell. Joe was really, <laughs> he was happy as a clam about that one. I never got that one. But uh, but he did, they did good shows for a while. They used some good talent. They gave some people some breaks. And he really, he legitimately believed, he wasn't in on a scam. He legitimately believed, even if, as Joe Coff would say, he might have been smoking a little of the hopium that he was going to be able to do those things and, and was going to be able to get that money. And the guy stuck him and he'd kind of stuck his neck out. So I think he, he uh, took Andrews on and they, they went as long as they could with it. But, um, but anyway, um, and he came to one of the early smoky mountain tapings. Joe did Joe and Bonnie both came up to Spartanburg cause it wasn't that far from Atlanta. And uh, I remember him visiting there. But, you know, after all of that, he's been in sales and, and owned, I think, some radio stations and been in radio advertising sales and stuff like that and just really stayed away from wrestling. And, I, you know, at that point, I don't blame it because he's so successful in other things and he's got these fucking people giving him bullshit in the wrestling business. Why would you, you know, really want to continue to be involved? I've asked myself that question many times. But I, he, was, he was fun. He was fun. I wish you'd have got a chance to meet him. Uh, I guess, what was it? Like I said, last year he had a stroke and they, they put a video out. You know, he was having to relearn how to speak and there was having a lot of trouble getting around. And, and so uh, I guess over the last year and being 70, that obviously probably didn't get a lot easier. So anyway, uh, to Bonnie, if she's listening, and I can't imagine why she would, but I love her. Uh, we, we send you our sympathy and all of his family and, and the fans that remember the old Saturday night superstars, of wrestling block that, that was, that was cool. I would, you would have loved that. How old were you in 1985? I was five. You would have loved that pull right up there in your little fucking zoom, zoom, little tricycle. You're right around the house. And in six hours, you'd have had to get up and go potty a couple of times, you know, between that and pro wrestling this week. And I guess you could even say the early days of the GWF. He did so many things that hardcore wrestling fans appreciate. Yeah, well, and as my, now, if if there was the because he was having to syndicate television at a time when every major company was trying to syndicate their wrestling show, but he did it, and he was trying to promote at a time when there was the end of the territories. I did the same thing, only on he wanted it to go national, but he did it for a while. Um. If if now if it was today and he had the internet and digital capability and you, you everybody's their own television station the he would be the he'd be Tony Khan he'd be the darling of every hardcore fan because he would be doing all kinds of shit they would just love and not in a bad way he I don't think Joe Petticino would have booked the Invisible Man uh, he he liked the wrestling business too much so you know if he had the advantages that they have today of of broadcasting and being able to show your shit all over the world and different revenue streams. You know, he was just, he was stuck like with the rest of us. We had to make money off tickets and TV advertising. 